my sister and I, we grew up in a street behind the zoo. My favorite animal was a polar bear. It happened to have the same birthday as me. <laughs> One day, when I was a toddler, my mother panicked. She grabbed me from the garden and took me inside. A police car with loudspeakers drove by, warning our neighborhood that a black panther had escaped. It wasn't until I'd grown up that I understood that the black panther, as a species, doesn't pose much of a danger. The animal that you should really be afraid of is Homo sapiens. We are the ones who have long escaped the zoo of nature. While we are on the loose, roughly seven and a half billion of us, we have wiped out many species. And this is the tooth of one of them. It's a fossilized remnant of a wild horse that lived more than 40,000 years ago. I found it um, on an artificial beach built as an extension to the harbor of Rotterdam. After picking up this token from the past, I tried to think away the North Sea in order to imagine this vast expanse all the way to the cliffs of Dover. During the Ice Ages, my wild horse, Equus ferris, used to roam these dry and windy plains, along with jackals and woolly rhinos and mammoths. Turning around, I found myself face to face with the actual industrial skyline, a forest of cranes and chimneys, and the complete pipeworks of two oil refineries. Welcome to the Anthropocene. Fossil in hand, I wondered what on earth has become of us since we hunted down the last Equisferis. Searching for clues, I went to Paris, to the Grande Galerie de Evolution. Here you'll find the skeletons of every known vertebrate, living or extinct. The primates stand out. They share a glass box, in front of which I met a group of young primates, little ones, <laughs> together with their primate teacher. And we were all wondering, who are we? According to Wikipedia, it's easy. We are two-legged members of the zoological family called hominids. Just like the chimpanzee, orangutan, or the gorilla, but with a more erect posture. Even a child knows there's more to it than that. But what? What is it that makes Homo sapiens stand out? In what specific ways do we differ from all the other animals to the extent that even a predator like the black panther should fear us? Also in Paris, but back in 1900, the Dutch presented an answer of sorts. At the famous World Exhibition, uh, we revealed the first model of the missing link between the animal kingdom and humanity. Nicknamed Pete, this artist impression was made by a Dutch pioneer called Eugène Dubois. Born in 1858, the son of a pharmacist. Now, contrary to Darwin, who believed that humans had lost their fur and their tail in Africa, Eugène Dubois was convinced we originated in Asia. At the age of 28, he traveled to the Dutch East Indies and set up camp at a riverside 
in central Java and started digging for the missing link. He came back years later with a skull cap, a thigh bone, and a mola of the prehistoric Javanese ape man. Now, the real stuff is locked up in a climatized safe, which is why I brought you this replica. Today, worldwide, this skull is considered to be the type-defining specimen of our direct ancestor, Homo erectus. Eugène Dubois himself described his trophies more than a century ago as belonging to the first primate to walk on its hind legs. Seen this way, humans quite literally had emerged out of the animal kingdom by standing up and, more importantly, freeing their hands to use tools like clubs and knives and pens and pencils. I am a writer, not a biologist. In my view, facts and words relate to each other as bones do to flesh. Like bones, facts never speak for themselves. It's us humans that give them a voice, as if we were fact whisperers. And this is a very typical habit of our species. We try to make sense of the world. No other animal seems so preoccupied with its origins, its destiny, uh, the meaning of life. But we humans, we link and click together facts into the backbones of our stories and theories and convictions. The procedure is pretty much in line with the biblical creation of Eve, since Eve was shaped overnight by putting flesh around a single rib taken from Adam's chest. This is what we do too. We often bandage ancient, odd-looking bones with the fabric of fabrication. Let's have a look at our image of Lucy, the Ethiopian ape woman, found in 1975 and named after the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, that was playing at her excavation site. Once unearthed, Lucy was presented to the world as the real missing link. Her hairy, life-size model even made it into the Grande Galerie de Evolution. But is this really what she would have looked like in real life more than two million years ago? Something strange is going on. Because the more we find, the less we seem to know. Remnants of the past, like teeth and bones, make up a bizarre and ever-changing puzzle. And the moment you think you see the contours of a figure, the picture becomes blurry again. In 2004, a new human was introduced on the cover of Nature magazine found in a limestone cave in Flores, Indonesia. Homo floresiensis has since uprooted all the existing family trees of our species. The extinct Flores hominids had dwarf-sized bodies. Standing barely a meter tall, they had flat feet and heads as small as grapefruits. At first, they were thought to be stray offspring of Dubois' Javanese ape man, but then shrunken into dwarfs. A competing theory considers them to have branched off from Lucy's early descendants in Africa, but cannot explain why then they ended up at the other side of the Indian Ocean. So where to place these little creatures on a t-shirt depicting our evolution? 
next to us, holding hands, right behind us. As a writer, um, I've often noticed that humans, most of them, prefer fiction to facts. Um, Science, of course, is a means to combat that, but it often doesn't stand a chance. Even in the long run, the historical account of the Beagle, the voyage of the Beagle, even in the long run, the historical account of the voyage of the Beagle, the ship that had brought Darwin to his groundbreaking insights, has not been able to replace the legend of Noah's Ark. Just picture the animals that came two by two, and then this torrential opening of the sluices of heaven. It's simply too good a story. In Flores, the lead scientist, Australian Mike Morwood, baptized his little humans, hobbits. And who can blame him? By referring to Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, he immediately had all eyes turned on his unique bone collection. It even helped him to secure funding for further excavations carried out by villagers in t-shirts saying, Hobbit, human mysteries in Flores. It is, I think, this thirst of, for fantasy. It is this thirst for fantasy, our power of imagination that sets Homo sapiens apart from all other animals. Besides food and shelter and clothing, we give our children bedtime stories. We're all nourished on fiction. Parents cannot omit the fables and the fairy tales. In life, we need stories to navigate society. So, among other things, this is what we are, fabulating storytelling animals. Being aware of our mortality, fighting death quite relentlessly. We render art, we render literature, and we even attribute signs and words to the scattered bones that we all will be reduced to. Eugène Dubois is buried under a gravestone decorated with his ape man fossils. In life, he used to crane over them. In death, he ended up underneath his hominid bones. And yet, through his legacy, through the ornaments on his grave, Dubois continues to spread his ideas. Stories live on after we die. Like species in nature, stories evolve. In a cultural habitat, they grow, compete, adapt to new circumstances. Stories multiply. They reproduce by being retold or reprinted. Like genes, stories mutate. Just whisper an anecdote into somebody's ears, who then retells it to their neighbor and so on until the last person says out loud what is left of the original. Many of the stories that we bring into circulation start leading lives of their own. Some of them get magical incarnations, like the mermaid, the unicorn, the dragon, and eventually we have populated entire heavens with goddesses and gods that in the real world exert real power over us. Now, there are many ways to depict the quintessential Homo sapiens. But I like this one especially. It's a lithograph made by the Dutch artist Escher in 1944, during the darkest hour of humanity. I'm stunned by its circularity, its dualism, and the motif of captivity 
We are strange acrobats trying to leave behind our animal past. And while we think we have escaped the laws of nature, we try to tame ourselves with edifying stories about heaven and hell. To put it differently, Homo sapiens voluntarily cages itself within the bars of its morals, derived from stories of good and evil. But, like hooligans pushing down a fence, we constantly break loose again. To all other species, we are the Black Panthers. The more than 20,000 animals on the red list of endangered species have reason to hide their young ones when they see a two-legged primate. So, I propose that we, as the inventors of morals and the creators of angels and devils, we come up with much more convincing stories to curb the destructive side of human nature. Strong stuff that can provide an antidote to our recklessness and self-centeredness as a species. Thank you.